We're going to take a look at a bunch of new projects and products that patrons of Sly Flourish are going to get access to today. These are all things that have come out recently in this past month. We're going to take a look at the article that Wizards of the Coast posted to D&D Beyond about their new content review process. I'm going to do a long talk about Quay's style techniques for dungeons and overland travel today. And we're going to do the next batch of questions from the Patreon November 2022 Q&A all today on the Lazy D&D Talk Show. I'm Mike Shea, your pal from Sly Sly Flourish, here to talk about all things D&D. This show, like all of the rest of the work of Sly Flourish, is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. Patrons get access to all kinds of exclusive material, the City of Arches sourcebook, adventure gener- dungeon generators, random generators of all different, dedicated Discord channel, the Patreon Q&A, all different kinds of things that patrons of Sly Flourish get access to. If you enjoy the work I do, you may want to become a patron of Sly Flourish and help me put on shows like this. You can find a link to becoming a patron down in the show notes below. And we're going to start off today by looking at some of the things that patrons of Sly Flourish get and got this month, the beginning of November. I have been working on a project for some time now. I'm really enjoying this project a lot. This is kind of a really fun, creative activity that I've been working on called the City of Arches. The City of Arches is a city sourcebook built for d d style adventures. The premise of the city is that it is a very old city with lots of layers and lots of weird nooks and crannies where all of these old archways still exist. The archways were once portals to other worlds, but now they only kind of work. And people and entities will come through these portals, losing their memories of where they came from and end up in the city. So it's a very multicultural city. Any of the races that you can find in any of your d d books make sense for this world. And also it is a land filled with adventure. The book, it's 42, 44 pages now. So it's getting bigger all the time. Every month it's getting bigger. I have a really new cool thing I'm working on for the next month too. Really big, big juicy section. I don't know. It might take me a little bit of time to do it because it's a great big thing. All different kinds of stuff about the city itself, all different things about how it works, notable NPCs, notable locations. Everything has adventure seeds dropped in all over the place. You'll find adventure seeds all over. Beautiful maps. Let me show the maps. Let's see, it's page seven and eight. Let's jump down to page seven and eight. Oh, I missed it. Great big side view of the map. Patrons get access to a full picture of this side view from both sides that show you all of the strange nooks and crannies that are going on. Definitely has sort of a Soulsborne style I, I, I feeling to it. I, I'm definitely into the Dark Soulsy kind of games. So it definitely has this verticality and lots of hidden chambers and lots of lore spread around this whole city all over the place. It gets bigger and bigger as I think about it. Here's a top view version of the uppermost layer, but that uppermost layer is only one layer. So what did I add for this month? I added two new things. One thing I modified heavily and one thing I added. I think thought it would be really interesting to do like an npc profile so i created a villain called brother cavill this is on page 19 uh this has original art by matt morrow who did the artwork for the lazy dm's companion i asked him if he would do a piece for this and he did it is a two-page biography of a villain an evil priest assassin i've had this priest assassin in a couple of other campaigns of mine i was like i really want to bring him in here i think it'd be really cool so he has a herald. He is a worshiper of the like the, the god of murder. Terrible things happened to him in his past that made him a worshiper of the god of murder. Very calm and collected. Stays out of the view. Not a big... He's, he's got a... Um, his herald is like out in front and very flamboyant. He is not. And I created a stat block for him and, and tactics. So he's a full workable... This is the first time I have a fifth edition stat block in the City of Arches. And he is intended to be like a solo level creature. He's very powerful. Challenge rating nine. He is a dangerous challenge rating nine. Lots of different stuff that he can do. Really fun. And then I have like encounters and tactics, the kind of things that he can do. So, and then you have knowledge checks. I took this idea from the the N-World Publishing's Monstrous Menagerie for level up 5e. I really like the idea of knowledge checks that you can do. And so I dropped that kind of thing in here. So that is a two page profile of Brother Cavill, this priest assassin. And of course, like everything in the city of Arches, you could just grab this and use it right in your game. You don't need to use anything else. If you're like, I just like the evil assassin priest. I want to have him in my game. Bang, here you go. Very, very universal enemy. The other thing I did is I updated the worlds beyond the arches. This section used to be a couple pages long and it had 10 different worlds that exist beyond the arches. So what do the arches connect to? And the idea is that you might drop lore of these in your game. They might find old books that talk about these worlds. They might get glimpses of them. There might be mosaics on the wall or they might actually travel to some of these worlds. And one of the things I wanted to do was add adventure seeds to all of these. So instead of just describing the world, I also want to drop in a good meaty adventure seed where you could have a whole adventure that is based on these worlds. And I had 10 of them. So I have 10 new adventure seeds. They're, they're pretty long. 
And each one also now has sort of a not quite read aloud text. It could be read aloud, but just like a narrative description that you could that you could read aloud or you could describe. You could turn directly into a secret. These sort of like Korax, the primeval land of the Red Star, has this introduction that's italicized that is almost read aloud text. And then each one has this adventure seed, which is how do the characters get involved? Who brings them in? Where do they find the key to open up the arch? How do they get through to the other side? And what do they find on the other side? And how do they accomplish their goal? So it went from two pages to I think five pages now, six pages. One, two, three, four, five. So it went from two pages or three pages to five pages long. So this section of Worlds Beyond the Arches is now a good meaty section. Lots of interesting stuff, adventure seeds you could grab. And once again, don't need to use the City of Arches for this. You could just grab onto one of these components and drop it in. So those are the two big improvements to City of Arches. It is getting bigger and bigger as we go. I really have been having fun writing it. I've been loving the feedback that I've been getting on it. And patrons of Sly Flourish get access to this immediately. All you have to do is become a patron to get access to this. The other thing that I put out is the Lazy DM Generator. Again, it doesn't generate lazy DMs, so I don't know that the name is exactly right. The idea here, this is built using Perchance. If you haven't checked out Perchance, Perchance is a wonderful site where you can build your own random generators with all kinds of functions and features. And this is actually hosted on Sly Flourish, not on Perchance. It, you, I, I, you, can, you can actually take a Perchance generator and download it and rehost it, and that's what I'm doing here. And the idea here is I wanted to combine a whole bunch of different generators with a whole bunch of different variables that I use. So you can create monuments, ancestral monuments. What's the difference there is... is Ancestral monuments are tied to like dwarves and elves and halflings and stuff where monuments are not. Monuments are not tied to a particular race. Items, NPCs, encounters, quests, uncommon magic items, and then DMG uh, level hordes. And then you can also choose which campaign setting you're operating in to add some lore from that campaign setting in it. So the idea is if you want to generate an item, you can say, I want an item from the Forgotten Realms. And you get a ruined feyish monocle of the Arcane Brotherhood or an abyssal shadowy icon of Joaquin or an opal divine statue of Orcus. That's kind of cool. You could say instead, no, I want to use Midgard. So you have a defiled gnomish lantern of the hunter. All the ones from Midgard, I have the page number from the Midgard world book where that person exists. So if you want more lore about who the hell Adarak, the mother of madness is, you can go pick up the Midgard world book and look up that section and fill it out. So we have Forgotten Realms, we have Eberron, Defiled Draconic Forked of the Heirs of Dakan, a Ruby Orgus Shard of the Lord of Blades. So if you want one that's flavored with Eberron. Uh, I have Domains of Dread, if you saw my Dreadful Incursions, same kind of thing. Infernal Unholy Forked Rod of Mordant, a Spiked Gnomish Crystal of Markovia, that kind of thing. So all those lists. General Demons and Devils, Flooded Natural Glove of Glacia, Bloody, bloody Undead Statue of that sort of thing. So you can pick that. So those are the campaign settings. And again, that works for if you want to create an NPC and you want one from Midgard, you could have Ismenia Freenocker, a surly human of Kespatan, the, drag the Dragon Lord of Stone. So again, it says like, well, where are they from? What kind of holy symbol are they wearing? That kind of thing. You can tie that in. And then you can add spells to it. And we have spells from the Player's Handbook, of course. And this links to D&D Beyond. So if you click this, you'll go to D&D Beyond. I think these are all of the free spells. I don't know if there's any of the paid spells, which means anybody should be able to click on this. You can click on Dream, and it goes straight to Dream from D&D Beyond. And I think everything here is from the basic rules, which is the stuff that's open to everybody. So if you want to have a poisonous clockwork monocle of Lada, the crossroads goddess of dawn, love and, and, and mercy, golden, that casts conjure woodland beings. Oh, I hate conjure woodland beings so much. You can get that. And we have deep magic. Now, it's the spells are in deep magic. It's not every spell in deep magic. It's all of the ones that are available as part of the Cobalt Press SRD. And that way you can link to them because who wants to go look up all these spells? An infernal prehistoric knife of Baco, the elven god of poetry that casts Skull Road. And you can click on that and it goes to the Cobalt Press OGL wiki that has the description of that spell. So you can see all of that stuff. So you have items. You can do an uncommon magic item. So if you want something, gloves of missile snaring, crack natural set of gloves of missile snaring of Freya and Freya, Freya and Freya, the twin northern gods of passion that cast Black Goat's Blessing. That's weird. So it's not, it doesn't always work. But that way you can tie items and or locations if you want a monument, right? We want a monument. Obsidian Titanic Fountain of Adarak, the Mother of Madness. Very cool. So building all kinds of stuff. If you've, if you've ever used the Lazy DMs Companion, you'll see lots of material that's in here. Really, really fun tip. At the bottom, by the way, read the tips at the bottom. Every page always generates the tips, so you can, you can check out the tips and learn how to use it. Again, available to all of the patrons of Sly Flourish. So if you become a patron of Sly Flourish, you get access to this generator. You can read the tips there. You can find access to this on your main rewards page on the Sly Flourish Patreon. To the patrons of Sly Flourish, 
Thank you so much. I hope you dig these things that I'm building because I sure am enjoying building them. Oh, the last thing, the last little preview. The last little preview is that I am working with Teo Sabadi and Scott Fitzgerald Gray on a big project that we're going to probably, I think we're going to plan on kickstarting it in February or March, a new book that we're working on. And parts of this book, we want to play test. So we are play testing it with all of our patrons. So Teos's patrons for Alpha Stream and my patrons for Sly Flourish get access to these play test documents. These are, we just put out one and was in the latest update. If you didn't see it, if you're a patron and you didn't see this thing and you want to take a look at it, you can find it, take a look through the last update either on the patreon site or in your email and you will get a list it's a pdf document about three pages long and we're looking for feedback on this stuff so definitely check that stuff out so those are all of the things that patrons of Flourish got this this month lots and lots of stuff that i've been working on that all came out sort of all all at once patreon is a fantastic deal hey my mom is here hi mom i i she's already a patron i believe so mom you, thanks thank you for your first support this past week wizards of the coast posted a note on dnd beyond which was interesting in itself. I know my friends uh, Sean and Teos on, on Mastering Dungeons are definitely going to be talking about the idea. Why didn't they post this to the Wizards of the Coast website? And it's really bizarre because the original discussion is all has to do with the Spelljammer issue. Spelljammer, this set of adventure, the, the, the Spelljammer box set came out last month and there was some stuff in it that was definitely, you know, pretty badly racist stuff that they had in this book. Certainly cringy stuff that is you know, best not left in your fantasy book. And they it, it slipped through all of their quality control procedures and ended up getting published. And there's a big backlash against it. It was a big mess. They described it originally on the Wizards of the Coast website and then also put up an errata on the Wizards of the Coast website. Then they said, oh, well, now we're going to talk about this new one, but we're going to do that on D&D Beyond. So clearly Wizards of the Coast doesn't know whether or not they're going to be publishing them stuff to Wizards of the Coast or to D&D Beyond, which is also Wizards of the Coast. They now have these two things. Anyway, it appears that they're leaning towards D&D Beyond. Uh, so there's a, an, an article written by Chris Perkins uh, again, it looks like it was written by the D&D staff, but for, by Chris Perkins about how they are going to be looking at things in the future. And it's all good stuff. Their plan is that they are going to make sure that they have sensitivity readers who are invested in, in the project early, looking at art, in the early writings, and in the final bit. And the one thing that they had said, and you're like, wow, that's a big one. The studio's new process mandates that every word, illustration, and map must be reviewed by multiple outside cultural consultants prior to publication. That That's a big deal, and that's pretty hard to do. Multiple cultural consultants are going to get the final look at something before it goes out, which makes sense because it, 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 what they said here is previously, inclusion reviews were done at the discretion of the project lead who identified which pieces. Well, the whole reason, this is a funny piece, because the whole reason you have a cultural consultant is because your project lead might not be aware of the things that they're putting in. So leaving it in the hands of the person who might not be aware to decide whether or not they should have one, you know, that's, that's tricky stuff. But this is going to be hard for them to do because one of the things that I know happens at Wizards of the Coast is their project process is not super clean. And we've seen some of the results of the project process, the whole process that they go through. I complained about it with Rhyme of the Frostmaiden. When Rhyme of the Frostmaiden came out, it was clear that like parts of the group had not talked to other parts of the group. It's famous for Descent into Avernus, where entire parts of the book were thrown away. The entire, much of that adventure was completely rewritten. Some of it around the marketing idea of like, hey, now you got to include Baldur's Gate. So there's all kinds of stuff that went into the process. So the process for development is not super clean and now they're adding this into it which kind of forces them to be super clean because the other thing to consider and i'm not this isn't just a watsy bash thing this especially speaking as a publisher like i'm sure you know if i hope to never have to run into situations like this but it's definitely something because i'm one dude so it's very easy for me and i have we did bring on cultural consultants for things like the uh, fantastic layers something we're definitely going to be doing and i'm going to be doing in the future but like this is the third time they got punched in the face on stuff like this like they had a bunch of cultural in insensitivity and in curse of Strahd. that got kind of called out and they sort of had to fix and reprint that there was the whole situation of when candle keep mysteries came out there was a whole bunch of issues that came out with that and now there was had with Spelljammer. so it's like the third time that they got punched in the face on this kind of stuff but now they're going to put it in place. So I'm glad they're doing it. I think it, hopefully it will lead to a better product overall, like beyond just being good culturally sensitive stuff, getting more readers to look at stuff and go, hey, this might not be an er issue of cultural sensitivity, but it looks like you have an error over here. That might be better. I'm glad they're doing it. And, you know, here we are. So, but I, it still brings up my problems with Spelljammer. So, you know, I'm still, Spelljammer, in my opinion, was not the best product that Wizards of the Coast ever put out. In particularly... I really didn't like the three book format and I hope they don't do that for Planescape. 
but I'm not hopeful. Today, I'm going to talk about a bit of advanced DMing called that I'm going to call jQuay's style design. I'm not the one who came up with this title. jQuay, jQuaying the dungeon is something that Justin Alexander from the Alexandrian, I think, popularized. The, the term jQuay's style design, the, the, the term jQuay's, comes from Janelle jQuay's, a designer of D&D products as far back as the late 70s, who had a very interesting style for building dungeons that offered a lot of things that made players excited to explore them. In his article, which you can find linked in the show notes below, and Justin's article about jQuay's style design, you can see the kinds of specific designs that exist there. And while they're focused primarily around the idea of dungeon design, and we're going to get into the specifics of what those mean, while it focuses on the idea of dungeon design, it also can be used for overland travel as well. This, a lot of the same techniques can be used for overland travel as well. So today we're going to look at what those specific design ideas are and how you can, how you can use them in your own in your own game my goal for this video is to share those design principles so that you can use them to find good maps and build your own particularly for, for both dungeons and for overland travel if you are designing your own maps many dms like to design their own maps these are some things this is almost like a checklist of things that you can look through and say does do i have these things or do i have most of these things or at least consider these things while you're building your dungeon but also it helps you look at dungeons that other people are putting out maps that you might find that you can look at and say, oh yeah, that map hits these ideas. It's got these concepts in it. And that way I can kind of grab that map and drop it right in my game and use that. But the other interesting thing is that you can use it for point crawls. You can use it for this idea of traveling in overland as well. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that. So I mentioned that Janelle J. Quays was a designer back in the, in the late 70s. Janelle J. Quays also did a lot of map design for video games. I believe she did some for Quake and she did some for Counter-Strike and Halo. I think she did it for one of the Halo games as well. So she has done actually design for video game maps as well as everything else. Again, that idea of making maps that are interesting to players, that are fun to explore, big component of her design. There is a link to her biography on Wikipedia down below. And this whole idea, again, comes from articles that Justin Alexander wrote called jQuaying the Dungeon. She has since said, I would prefer you refer to it as jQuazing the Dungeon because her name is Janelle jQuaze. And she's like, that S is there for a reason. So I'm calling it jQuaze style techniques. But you can find a link to Justin Alexander's articles, fantastic articles down in the show notes below. There's also other videos on YouTube that have talked about this as well. I'm going to link to some of those videos in the, in the description below. So let's talk about the details. What exactly is a jQuay's style dungeon? So a jQuay's style dungeon has a few different characteristics. Justin breaks down a lot of these characteristics, but I'm going to focus on seven pieces. And as a DM, you can kind of look at these pieces and say which ones make sense and which ones don't and choose the ones that you that you really like. Some of the characteristics of jQuay's style design includes multiple entrances. Are there multiple ways to actually access this dungeon? Can you get in from alternate paths? Are there multiple paths once you're in there? Is there not just one sequential path that you're going through from room to room, but is there multiple ways to get through a dungeon? Are there loopbacks? Once you've gotten so far in, can you see other routes that loop back around and reach other places that you're familiar with? That adds this element of discovery, this idea of like, oh, now I know where we are. Now I know where we're in relation because I went this other path, but I can see this other path back. That's a loopback. Elevation changes. These could be either minor elevation changes or major elevation changes. Do you have sections of your dungeon that sit over another side? Are there stairs? Wells that lead down? Are there tunnels that go underneath other parts of the tunnels? Elevation changes like that. Are there secret passages and connections? Are there secret ways to get from one place to another? Are there secret rooms? It works best when it's not just a secret room off to its side, but actually a whole other passage that can go around another part so that the characters and the players feel like they're gaming the system. They feel like they've figured out a secret and a secret way to bypass stuff. You want to add things like that. Are there multiple level connections? If you have a multi-layer design, multiple levels, is there like, well, yeah, there's a stairwell that takes you from one to two, but there's also a well that goes all the way from level one to level four or there's this huge crack that cuts across the dungeon that actually connects three levels of the dungeon together if you have multiple level connections that adds a lot of interesting layers to your dungeon and of course you don't have a uniform design that there isn't one sort of sequential design justin refers to this as non-euclidean design this idea that not everything is perfectly symmetrical and works well but it's strange it operates in strange ways the reasons why we want to do this kind of thing is they give players a feeling of 
discovery that while they're exploring a dungeon, they get this feeling that they're starting to crack the design. They're beginning to understand it, but it's complicated enough that they're not going to understand it right away. If you have a sequential dungeon, if you have five rooms connected by four hallways, they're going to understand how that works. There's only one path and they're going to know what it looks like. But if the, if there's these options, oh, which one, which entrance do we want to take? Do we need to go through the front door? Do we want to try to sneak over the wall or are we going to use that old sewer system? That's why I like having multiple entrances is really useful. And we want to offer meaningful choices. Instead of going in a room and there's a hallway to the left and a hallway to the right, why are you going left? One is a natural passageway or one is a sewer that hasn't been touched in a while but could be filled with terrible oozy monsters. But the other way is going to be guarded more carefully. We want to offer those meaningful choices. We want to make sure that the choices that we're offering to players, there's a reason why they would want to pick one over another and that both of them are valid. We don't want to just say like, well, one is clearly the better choice. We want to offer multiple choices where it's clear why you would take one choice over another, but there's good reasons to do one over the other. This kind of design gives players the excitement of discovering secrets. Secret doors, Justin Alexander has another thing where he talks about discovering traps. And he says like, they, you want your players to discover nine out of the 10 traps because discovering a trap is way more fun than stepping in one. You want us to have some times where they step in a trap. The same way with our dungeon design, that when the characters get to discover what's going on, when they find these secret passageways, when they find these ways, especially if those ways let them crack the dungeon design, it really feels cool. It gives them that excitement of understanding how the dungeon works. Like, how does this place operate? They're learning it piece by piece. Again, the place is complicated enough that they have to figure it out. There's some level of system mastery required for them to figure it out. But once they figure it out, they go, ah, this is really cool. And it makes the place feel real. If you have a great big dungeon and part of that dungeon was hit by an earthquake and there's a giant crack and the crack actually connects three layers if you just throw a rope over, it makes it feel real. It doesn't feel like you're building a puzzle for the characters or it makes it feel like they've got this place where there's a real reason to go. So what are some examples of J. Quay's style dungeon design? So I'm going to pick the Tomb of the Nine Gods from Tomb of Annihilation, the adventure Tomb of Annihilation. Will Doyle designed this dungeon. Will Doyle has talked about the design of this dungeon. DM David actually did an article that talked about this. I will link to the DM David article in the link below. It's really good. But what you can see just from layer one, just from the first level, because this is a multi-level, I think five or six levels, but we're just going to pick on this first level. And the neat thing about this dungeon is it's got multiple paths. It only has one entrance, one main entrance, so it's violating that one. But we do have like this whole cross-cutting river that cuts through and it can connect to multiple places that's that multiple levels it's got that sort of asymmetric design it's got ways that it cuts through you also have these secret doors that lead to secret areas and that's because this whole dungeon has like a separate set of hallways that the people operating the dungeon work in so when the characters figure out how, how to crack this part of it they are able to discover things that they, whoever built the dungeon in the first place didn't want you to discover and that is fun so there's a lot of really cool bits here you can see like there's a secret wall on the right hand side leading from this one chamber that goes down to the river so you don't have to go back out the same way you can instead go down to the river so that's one example of a j Quay style dungeon you can see it's got secret passages it's got secret connections it's got loopbacks it doesn't have multiple entrances but that's kind of the design of the adventure is there's one big door that you that you get through it's got elevation changes it's got lots of different things for a much simpler example we have some of the maps that we used in fantastic lairs fantastic lairs is a book that i worked on with scott fitzgerald gray and james intercasso and some of the things that i was working working on with the design is I was keeping these ideas of jQuay style dungeons, even for very small layers. So it doesn't need to be nearly as extensive as, as what you saw with the Tomb of the Nine Gods. So this is an example from Caves of the Cockatrice, which is actually a free layer that you can download. Again, links in the show notes below. And you can see it's got multiple entranceways. We have an entrance. We have actually three different ones. There's a passageway from the north, from the southeast. There's the most direct passageway. And then there's an underground river that you could, you could potentially follow. There is a secret entrance right here. If you're going into this main hall, there's a secret entrance to the north that leads you to this big hole. And this hole leads down into the river. So you could actually follow the river, which then can go up a waterfall and lead to the back of the chamber. And then a central main chamber. So we have elevation changes we have secret doors we have loopbacks we have alternate passageways but it's really like a three room dungeon you have this main entrance here you have this little side secret entrance here and then you have this main hall and then like a small small passage so this is a very small dungeon four or five rooms and some of them are very small but we included all of the loopbacks the secret paths all of the stuff that you can see in a jQuay style design i tried to pack into some of these small maps this is the map for the lair called ithric's black bile where you fight a black 
black dragon. In the same way, there's only one entrance, but we have one entryway in. There is a sewer that's in sort of a fetid pool over here on the right that leads to this whole secret passage. There's a really nasty undead white down here. And that sewage passage, you can sort of, again, elevation change, right? We went from this one level. We go one level down. You follow this hallway. It skips out this whole other area, and you come out this sewer in the rear part of the lair. And then we also have the main area that you can go to. We have elevation changes. We have loop backs. We have secret passages. You can see a lot of the designs that we have in, again, very simple map. It's really one big room, but it's got a couple of like entry halls in it. Choices. Characters can make choices about where they go. One thing I've learned, if you offer a main path and a secret path, players are almost always going to pick the secret path because it's cool and that's fine. It, you, you still want to make sure the main path is a viable way to go. You don't want to assume they're only ever going to take the secret path but you can probably guess that they're likely to take the secret path. So if you offer a secret path, expect that they're going to go down that way. One of the other things we did with the design of this adventure is the number of encounters that you go through is the same in whatever path you take. That way you can fit it into your, into your adventure. So if you're offering multiple paths and loopbacks and everything, you want to kind of think about, well, how many encounters are the characters going to run into? And does that fit the number of encounters I'm expecting for the time that I have or the pacing that I want for the game? So that's something to consider when you're, when you're looking at this. One more example from Fantastic Layers on what a J. Quay's style design looks like in a very small package. This is from the Centipede Cult Adventure. It's a first level adventure part of the layers. And again, very straightforward. Main entry hall, little side hall. You can go right through the main door and deal with the evil cultists that are going on here. Or you can find this little secret path. This is very simple and straightforward. This is about as simple as you can get. Doesn't really have elevation changes, although it's got a big hole. Maybe you have a whole dungeon level below that hole. Right in the, in the book, it's just filled with a giant centipede. But you've got multiple paths. You've got loop backs. You've got secret Secrets, you've got all that kind of thing. This is about as simple as you can make a J. Quay's style design and still have it offer some fun, some fun alternatives. For another example of a J. Quay's style dungeon, I picked one from Dyson Logos. One thing that when I when I mentioned before that this gives you the opportunity to go look at other people's maps and decide does it have these elements in it? And not it's not to say like one map is good and one map is bad if it doesn't, but you can definitely tell linear based dungeons versus more of a J. Quay's open style dungeon. Dyson from DysonLogos.com definitely understands how J. Quay's style maps work. So this map from Dyson Logos definitely is way bigger than the ones we did for Fantastic Layers. But again, you can see all of these ideas in here. It's got elevation changes. You have this whole waterway in the back. You've got multiple entrances. There's a secret entrance over here on the right, upper right. There is a, on the lower side, there is a whole river that flows through. There's main chambers and it looks almost symmetric, except not quite. There's different, different layers that go in. You have secret passageways. You have loopbacks. You have all of the different things. Again, really big dungeon. Lots of different ways to explore. And you could you could just grab this and fill it out with your own ideas. You can see the secret passages in the upper right. So definitely grabs onto those 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 ideas of loopbacks, elevation changes, multiple entrances, multiple paths secret discoveries, all, the, all those kinds of things. The last dungeon I will look at is one from the adventure Vault of the Dracolich. This is actually a dungeon that I designed with Teo Sabadia and Scott Fitzgerald Gray for a project that we did for Wizards of the Coast about 10 years ago. And my, my little claim to fame is this is in the Dungeon Master's Guide. If you go in the back of the Dungeon Master's Guide, you can find this map. What I find interesting about this one is this is the one where I started to learn about these ideas. Because when I first designed the map, I sent it into Wizards of the Coast. Greg Bilsland was working there. And Greg Bilsland said, yeah, that's not the kind of map design we're using for D&D Next. Those sort of linear, sequential, one room after another, that's not how it goes. We need more interconnections. We need more loops. We need this stuff. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I had to learn this idea while we were designing this map. But I think it came out really well. Again, this is actually used for a multi-table event. So not only does it have multiple entrances, it has enough entrances that like six different groups could come in from different sides. We have one, two, three at the top, four, five, six seven different entrances all kinds of loopbacks all kinds of secrets like down here in the jail cell area you can pull these up and you can go down to the river area elevation changes secret entrances multiple paths multiple ways to go through there is a whole lot of different ways to interact with this this is another example that kind of encapsulates these principles for what a j Quay's style dungeon has looking back at those characteristics what are multiple entrances multiple paths loopbacks elevation changes secret passages multiple level connections if you have a multi-level dungeon and a non-uniform design all the maps that I showed kind of have those ideas. Not all of them have all of them. For example, elevation changes, sometimes they don't have them. Multiple entrances, sometimes you don't want it. So don't hang on too hard to all of these, but these are a lot of really good principles that I think we can apply. Now here's where it gets really interesting. We can not only use these for dungeons. We can use these for overland travel as well. 
If you think about overland travel, there is a concept in overland travel. Again, Justin Alexander is the one who got this term to me. It actually came from the Hills Canton blog. Again, I will link to all of the sources for this, which is this idea of a point crawl. I've talked about point crawls too before. So there's a link to my video about point crawls. There's a link to my article about point crawls. You can find all that in the show notes below. The idea of a point crawl is essentially you're building overland travel like you're building a dungeon. Instead of rooms and passages, you have locations and paths. You have, and a location may be small. It could be like a single monument in the woods, a weird statue that's kind of half buried in the woods, or it could be a whole city. And the pathway could be anything. It could be a dry riverbed. It could be a game path. It could be a weird, unnatural path where butterflies always seem to be flowing. It could be a ley line you see in the sky that happens to be pulling a certain way. So the paths can be anything, but they should be something that you can see in, in, in the world. And when you're designing a point crawl, you can keep a lot of the same principles in mind that you're doing for a jQuery style dungeon. Does it have loopbacks? Does it have secret paths? Does it have ways that you can kind of come into it? Does it have multiple ways that you can get out? Do you Are they offering mean, meaningful decisions? Some of the stuff like elevation changes, you could certainly have that. Do you want to go through the mountain pass versus going down the riverbed? So you have sort of a Z axis approach to it. A lot of the same principles apply. And we're going to take a look at just a couple of point crawls that do this. So here's an example point crawl that I use for an Eberron game. This one's a little bit symmetrical. It was some of my earliest work designing a point crawl. You have locations and you have pathways. I didn't identify the pathways themselves, but you could definitely identify like what is this path? What does it have here? But the idea is, you know, if they start at Karshak Station, which path do they want to take? And do, can they find secret paths that lead elsewhere? This is actually in the very next session. This is about going through a town. And the idea is that you can start at like the Impaled, this one section, and you have these different paths that you can take. There, are, the the dash lines are secrets. So like the old tunnel and the ter the teleporter. You have the like the road of triumph, the cracked road, the twisted black thread. These are all different ways that the players can navigate this city that they're traveling through. This is kind of a fancy way to do it. You can really just take a piece of paper and draw it. But again, what do you see? Asymmetric design, secret paths, loopbacks, all the same kind of stuff. Multiple entranceways. In this case, they could go in through the front gate or they could actually go through from the back. The same kind of principles that apply for dungeon design can apply to overland travel as well. When you're sitting down thinking about how people are going to travel in the overland, instead of just having like a, a location and a path and a location and a path, you could say like, well, what are some secret paths that go off from these locations? What are other paths they could take? Are there alternate paths? What are the locations? When they get to a, play, a path, if they go further ahead, is there a way to see that there's actually another path that they might discover that could take them back where they came originally. Same sort of ideas. We're looking at it for dungeon design, but a lot of it works very well for overland travel as well. So the next time you are either looking at dungeon maps, thinking about your dungeon maps, thinking about your overland travel, keep in mind some of these jQuays style designs. And that includes, are there multiple entrances? Are there multiple paths they can take? Are there good, meaningful decisions about taking one path over the other? Does it have secret paths? Are there ways to crack the dungeon? Are there ways to sort of get past it and, and get a one-up on the people who actually operate this dungeon by taking these secret paths. Are there loopbacks? Once you get to a place, can you see that there's another passage and can you start to understand how the dungeon works by realizing, oh, that goes back to where we were before, that idea of loopbacks and shortcuts. And make sure that it's not too symmetrical. You don't want a dungeon design that's boring. You don't want one that's so simple that it's like one room and then a passage and another room and then a passage and another room and a passage. That's that's too easy to crack. The, the, the design of the dungeon itself isn't particularly interesting. Maybe what's in the rooms are interesting. Maybe the rest of the story is interesting, but that design is an industry. Can you take that and can you kind of shake it up? Does it have elevation changes? Are there stairs that are going up and down? Are there sections of the floor that are dropped in? Thinking about Think about that Z axis. If you want to get really advanced, think about your Dark Souls style where you go through and climbing up and up and up and further, and then you find an elevator that takes you all the way down back to where you started. So you have a loop back, but the loop back is vertical rather than horizontal. And what are some ways if you are going to have multiple layers what are some of the ways that you can have dropped connections to this i'm running the game scarlet citadel there's an obliet in one of the rooms that obliet goes four levels down so not only are there stairways that take you from level one to level two there's a whole other passageway that goes all the way down to level four in the first layer of the zone so what are some of those multiple cross level connections big cracks in the walls rivers that are flowing waterfalls that are falling down into lower levels how do you connect these lower levels together 
Let's do some Patreon questions. Every week on the Lazy D&D Talk Show, I go through questions from Patreon. We have a monthly Patreon Q&A. I answer every question that people post there. Some of those questions I take and bring to this show. Other ones will become their own video or their own article, depending on the topic. Patrick M. says, I am currently running an Icewind Dale campaign, and I am designing one of my own villains in the campaign to be a recurring antagonist. Do you have any advice on how to bring a villain to a fight to fight the adventurers, but still keep that villain alive? so that they can return without railroading the combat. No. If you are setting up a situation where the villain is going to survive a fight with the characters, you're kind of railroading the battle. Now, there are some tricks, though. There's some things you can do. Depending on who the villain is, do they have some kind of way of surviving even if the fight goes really far against them examples are vampires and liches so vampires and liches have ways to survive battles kind of built into them liches can go back to their phylactery and vampires can uh, turn into mist and kind of float back to their coffin so they have ways to survive a mage with simulacrum likewise can send the simulacrum rather than themselves so if you defeat the simulac simulacrum you just uh, defeat that one thing and the mage is still alive they have sort of built in ways that i would consider to be acceptable for the story of dnd it makes sense that they do those if your villain doesn't have one of those built-in safeguards and you are not prepared for that villain to die in the battle i would not have them in the battle because certainly players know who their villains are and they want to kill those villains and they want to kill them as soon as they can so you're kind of robbing them of that ability if you pull the haha i'm just going to get in my little cart and ride away and you can't catch me so you, go, you definitely want to be careful. You're on, you, recognizing the fact that you, you feel like it's railroading is a good first step because you haven't done it yet. I have, I'll, tell, I'll tell you a secret one, though. This is one that I haven't yet dropped into a game, and I really want to try this one day. I want to have one where you defeat the villain right away, and you kill him. But it turns out the villain's plans were dependent upon their death, and all of the plans are going on even though the villain is dead. And it would be even more fun if the players would be better off, the characters would be better off trying to figure out how to get the villain back because the villain's the only one who can undo some of the plans that took place. Like the villain had a dead man switch. The dead man switch has been picking up and, and all kinds of things are, are, are happening. There is a, a book called Daemon, D-A-E-M-O-N, Demon, that is about a guy who dies and had put all of these things in place to basically take over the world after his own death. Right. And he's already gone. They can't arrest him. They can't deal with him. They can't take him out. It's already happening. It's already out there. I really love that idea. I really wanted to have like a, even like a commoner, a commoner who managed to pull the strings of some of the most powerful entities in the world to get them to do something. And then he's killed. And it doesn't matter because all the strings are pulled and it's all happening anyway. I really like that idea. But but yeah, there's not a great way to have a villain engage in combat with the characters and have them survive that doesn't feel like railroading unless it's really built into the character. So I would be careful with that. So Patrick, good good for you to identify that issue. I don't know if I have a great immediate solution to your problem though. Instead, I would probably have the villain not show up or have heralds of the villain show up or other agents of the villain or let the villain die. You have more villains. You have as many villains as you Victor N says, I'm currently using Notion to organize my prep campaign, but I find that jumping between Notion and printed notes during play can be a little chaotic and overwhelming. I'm curious to hear how you straddle digital and traditional sources for in-person play, particularly when running a pre-written adventure. I noticed in your Witchlight Notion page that you include very few details of the NPC and location databases. For example, how much info do you have on paper versus digital at any given time? And how do you decide what medium is best for a given resource? This is something I've had to relearn now that I've been going back to in-person games. I, it really was a struggle when I first first did an in-person game i was like at the table like oh my god i don't even know what i'm supposed to have like what do i use for initiative how do maps work like all of these things because i've been playing for online for like two years ish and then suddenly i'm back at the table again what i figured out is i i now take my notion template for the session notes for my in-person game and i'll format them in word i'll get them down to one page front and back in word i'll change the font size i'll get rid of stuff that i don't need i'll delete lines i don't need and I will print my notes on a piece of paper. So my core notes I have in front of me. And that helps me with secrets and clues, names of NPCs, all the stuff that I generally need at the table, I can put on that one sheet. And then I'll keep my phone handy. So if I have to look up an NPC and find a description for them, I can go click on that description and get it. But generally speaking, that's been working. The other thing is I don't, I don't stress too much about having to go look something up. I mentioned, I've mentioned many times that 
especially for my in-person games, I will put the page numbers of certain elements in my notes so that when I print it, I have the page numbers and I can go whip out the book and look it up. So if I'm looking up a book from like Toma Beasts or I'm looking at a book from like the Midgar World book, I have the page number there and I have the Midgar World book there and I can just flip to that page and read it. That really helps a lot. Write down your page numbers, boys and girls. It is really, really helpful. You can also, what else can you do? So formatting my notes has helped a lot. And printing them out and getting them on, on both sides has helped a lot. And the other one is I don't stress. If I, if I can't find something right away, I don't stress. I just say, hang on a sec, let me look up that name. We're not in the middle of a play. We don't have an audience of 5,000 people, right? It's okay for us to say, hang on a sec, I forgot that dude's name. Does anybody remember what this guy's called? Oh, yeah. Well, hang on, let me check my notes. Yeah, this guy's name is this. Like, this is D&D. We're all sitting around. We're all having fun. Don't stress too much about having to look up certain things. It's okay. But yeah, if you can find special tricks that help you get the right notes in front of you, don't be opposed to paper because a piece of paper with stuff written on it is, in my experience, a lot easier than trying to unlock your phone, loading an app, looking for stuff. There are lots of areas where using the physical stuff is easier than using the digital stuff. I had a player in one of my games where I said, like, you can roll with just dice on your table. And they were still using the digital dice in our dice rollers online. And I was like, you know, just roll the dice. And, and one of the women I was playing with said, oh my God, it's so much easier to roll physical dice. I forgot how easy this is. <laughs> I was like, you know, it's so much easier than typing out weird commands or, you know, using Avre for dice commands. And they like to, because they want everybody to see it, but it doesn't matter. Just roll and say what you got. It works really well. Many areas where analog is easier than digital. Joseph C says, I just wrapped up a weekly campaign that lasted 30 months. Have you ever grieved after a campaign ending? It feels hard to let go and move on. Yes, I have. When I did my fourth edition campaign, it was about three years for a big, long first to 30th level campaign. And I felt a lot of melancholy at the end. I was very satisfied that we had accomplished it. And also at the same time, like we may never see these characters again. And we haven't. And we may, it's looking less likely we ever will see those characters again. And the stories that we shared, there definitely was this sort of, you know, happy and sad feelings of the end of the campaign. Running shorter campaigns has made me just as happy without that sadness. Because the campaigns are relatively short, I know I'm going to get into a new one. It's been very, very good, but I, I, it's rare where I feel like, oh man, I feel so bad about this. The other one is don't cut yourself off from offering to do a one shot later if players want to do it. So like keep the door open to say one day we might return to these characters and jump sometime in the future and have another little adventure with them. Keep that idea in mind. It makes you happier and it'll make the players happier if they love those characters. You never have to say goodbye to these characters. We could, we could bring them back. You can, you can have them show back up. Maybe you, you know, you're probably not likely to bring them all back, but you might. So there's no reason to cut that off. But yeah, that, that feeling, I've definitely had that feeling. The better the campaign, the better that feeling is, the stronger that feeling. But shorter campaigns, I'm, I'm happier to run more short campaigns. By short, I mean like a year, right? As on, on an average of a year. And those are still long and I still feel pretty good about them. Still feel some melancholy at the end of it. But I still really enjoy them. And, and we know that we're going to get a new campaign. So knowing that we're going to get in a new campaign definitely also kind of helps ease that, ease that pain. But I've definitely, I know the feeling that you have. Christopher W. says, how do you decide what campaign to run? I'm suffering from choice paralysis. So I have some new rules for myself in what kind of campaigns I'm going to run. I've talked about this in a previous show, I think. Maybe it was on my Scarlet Citadel show where I talked about this. One is I'm not going to run an adventure that just came out. I'm going to wait for it to, for, to go off for a few months. And the reason why is it helps when other DMs are able to share their experiences with me when I'm going to run it. I would like other people to run it and learn from them to learn about this, about this adventure that I'm going to run. It also makes sure I'm out of the hype, the hype train that when a new adventure comes out, I, I get this feeling of like, oh man, everybody's on board with this thing. I definitely want to play it. I felt that way with Spelljammer. I felt that way with Frostmaiden. I felt that way with Descent into Avernus. And I, I find that I would rather let the hype die off before I'm going to run it. To really ask myself, am I interested in running this? The other one is I'm not going to run anything I don't dig. If I read it and I don't like it, or the parts of it I don't like, I don't want to run it. There's enough adventures to run that I don't have to, and it takes long enough to run these, that looking at something and feeling like, eh, I don't know if that's going to work. Now I read them, and if I'm excited by them, and I know that I'm willing to work through any potential issues that they have, I'll, I'll go ahead and run it. But this is kind of a new a new feeling that I've got. And then once I have some ideas for some campaigns, I'll talk about them with my players. And again, I'm not going to bring forward anything that I don't want to run. And a lot of times I'll, 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 I'll be pushing one ahead of the others. Hey, how would you guys feel if we ran Dragon of Stormwreck Isle plus Light of Xeraxis? Both of these look really good. 
you know, would you, how would you guys feel about a campaign about this? And usually they go, oh yeah, that sounds really great. I haven't had a lot of players that are like, no, I don't want to do that one. Right. I haven't, I don't think I've had, I've had some players who up front told me like, yeah, I don't want to do Descent into Avernus, but it's, it's, you know, generally I haven't brought one forward and had them say, oh no, that's, that's, that's one. I, they're, they're pretty happy. So narrowing it down, I would say, which one really grabs you the most? Recognizing the fact that you can only run about one of these a year and don't, don't sweat the ones you can't run. There's a lot of them out there. There's lots of them I look at. I go, oh, I'd love to run a Tolus campaign. And maybe one day I will. Just say maybe one day. And, and it makes me happier. So, Chris, I hope that answers some of the questions about choosing choosing a campaign. Pick ones you dig. Chris W. says, since you have made Midgard cool recently, I've been checking out the Midgard world book. I didn't make it cool. Midgard was already cool. I'm just enjoying it. I have noticed that they have an optional time flies rule that suggests having at least twice as much time pass in game as the real world. This appeals quite a lot to me. My current campaign is taking 19 real time weeks so far, but only about eight weeks as advanced in the game. And we have leveled from three to 12 and performed all sorts of heroic feats, which seem very fast. I just wonder if you have tried this time flies rule or anything similar and whether you had any thoughts on it. I have not tried it. I did see it and I liked it, but I, I, a lot of times when I see kind of optional rules like this i don't i don't like that they have a a real set parameter to them and instead it's like well why don't i just let time fly when i think it's right so the example is instead of saying like well out of every week of game time there is two weeks of in world time well that forces you to be like wow the characters are in the middle of a dungeon but two weeks go by that doesn't make any sense instead i think it's great to to find and i i think i want to do more of it when there are moments in the game's story where it makes sense that some time could fly by and doing that as downtime, saying like three weeks are going to go by between this or maybe a month passes. Let's talk about what the characters did over the past month. What are some of the things that they did before this next section of the campaign picks up? I think that I would rather have time leap in that way when you decide when to drop it in and you decide how long it goes and you don't have to tie a formula to it you can just decide here's here's what makes sense here's what would be fun talk about it with the players and ask them like how much time do you want to have go by before the next part and with recognizing they can reconnect with old friends or family or other npcs they can work on downtime quests or other things they can gather information you know the only thing they're not going to do is like adventuring because you, you know, adventuring is what we're focused the rest of the game on. So I, I do, I like the idea a lot. I don't think you need to play too hard with the rule that's in the book. And instead you can take that idea, take the spirit of the idea and bring that into your campaign and have it make sense. Like when would it make sense in my Scarlet Citadel game versus my Empire of the Ghouls game? I think Empire of the Ghouls has more opportunity for that, but maybe there's time in Scarlet Citadel where there'd be downtime. We'll see. So I'd, I'd like to take more advantage of that idea because I've played other games where we had downtime often like Shadow of the Demon Lord and that worked really well. So I'd love to do, I'd love to do more of that. Toy B asks, and thank you for the pronunciation. Pronounce like Toy B, don't ask. Toy B says, you've been talking a lot about making character sheets the old way, the old ways. I always, I also did that recently in, in games of mine. Maybe I'm just out of habit, but it felt slow and unintuitive after years of D&D Beyond. I mostly DM and my players feel even more strongly about this. It's one thing to have a finished character sheet in front of you, but making one is another story. Do you have any advice on how to go about that? Do you know any simple way in which I could teach my players or make their life easier when creating paper character sheets? I'd really like to lower the bar for them to consider making old fashioned character sheets instead of sticking to D&D Beyond and the material there. So I, I think a way to draw your players into the idea of working with paper character sheets. So, so to me, like I'm not a technophobe. I don't feel like we should be using paper character sheets period. I feel like because D&D Beyond doesn't offer some things that we want, and because when you're using D&D Beyond, you're kind of locked into the things that it's got and the way that it does it, it limits our ability to use source material from other groups. I think if if it was really easier, let's pretend for a minute that they had all the material from all the other third-party publishers in there, I would be complaining as much. So I'm not opposed to using D&D Beyond. And if, you're, if you don't care about these extra sources, I would say, and people are happy using it, I would say, go ahead and use it. But one of the ways that you can kind of get players more not excited about using a paper character sheet, but certainly more willing to use one, is if you are offering character options that aren't in D&D Beyond. If you, if, it, if you make it easier. Now, one thing is I've definitely seen players who still are like, oh, well, I'll just add it to DNA Beyond, which is way harder than using a paper character sheet. There are definitely times where it's like, it, trust me, it is just easier to use a paper character sheet. But I have players, smart players that have been playing forever, very experienced, very smart people who are like, wow, I just audited my character sheet and my numbers are wrong all over the place. And it's like, yeah, that can happen because it's not doing all the math for you. So I think it's tricky, but a way to draw players into being more accepting of a paper character sheet is offering them character options that they can't get otherwise. And, and that, can, that can help bring them there. So I think both of my groups, people are using paper character sheets mostly. I think I've got one. 
I've got one player who was using it, but I also had another one who's like, oh, I took a, I took a subclass that's not from the proper subclass list. I'm like, yeah, we talked about this. So it's, it's definitely hard. And, you know, I think if anything, it shows that d and Beyond is really strong because it's not easy to get people to love a digital tool as much as they love d and Beyond. So it's a, it's a strong one. I think it's probably something we're going to struggle with for a long time. Arash S says, I'm planning to run the Black Wheel as a side quest for my players that have level 11 characters. Are there any glaring issues with running this adventure that's intended for level seven? Will it be fairly straightforward to scale up the difficulty, i.e. higher AC, hit points, and proficiency bonuses, or are there some other complicated changes that need to be considered? The biggest change to consider is the, the theme of the adventure. What I would do if I were in your shoes, and you did ask me, so it's not inappropriate for me to offer my advice. What I would do is think about what the Black Wheel is like as a tier three opponent, that instead of being a local city block that is a mimic, spoiler, for the black wheel, by the way. What if it's taken over a whole city, right? What if there are maybe multiple black wheels? There's like a hive of black wheels. So the black wheel had a hive of mimics that it controlled. But what if it has grown and spread even more so? Think think a whole like exponential layer. Think an, a power of 10 greater than what the original black wheel. Because the minute you go from like seventh level, which is a tier two adventure to 11th level, which is tier three, you're jumping the whole scale. So what is a city sized mimic like? And I don't just talk about like a castle that tries to eat you. I'm talking about like an entity deep underground that's controlling the city up above. That's running thralls all over the place where half of the people have been overtaken with doppelgangers. Take the story of the black wheel and expand that out one whole order of magnitude. So it's less about the statistics of the black wheel because you can always monkey around with the statistics and do stuff. Just take a dragon, take a, take a, one of the dragon stat blocks and do some mimic stuff and you're good. Or take the black wheel and just up all that stuff. But think about what multiple black wheels would be like. How do you scale out that story? Think about that and make that more exciting so that your level 11 adventure doesn't feel like a level seven adventure, only higher level. Think about the scale of the story that matters for 11th level adventures. The reason why I put this question in here is not because I wanted to talk about the nitpicky of increasing AC or hit points. It's because I want to talk about the scaling up your whole story of your adventure to something that's way bigger. Don't be afraid to think in a power of 10 as you cross the tiers. That first to fourth level is one power tier, local town problems. Fifth to eleventh, fifth to tenth level, that's like city and regional. Uh, you know, eleventh level and beyond is like world, you know, region and worldwide. Seventeenth and above is planar, right? That think of scales of ten. How much bigger are the planes of existence compared to the town you're in? Four orders of magnitude, according to my math. So think about how to expand the story and worry about that more than the statistics of the monster. The monster you can you can monkey with. Give it more hit points. All the stuff you said. Give it more hit points. Let it do more damage. Double every, double all the numbers and you're probably good. My friends, I want to thank you for hanging out with me today while I talked about all things D&D. If you enjoyed this show, consider subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter where you get access to a new D&D article sent directly to your inbox. You also get a PDF, a free PDF adventure generator. You can also support me directly on Patreon. Patrons get access to all kinds of exclusive material, the City of Arches source book, the Lazy DM generator, random generator set, the Patreon Q&A, all different kinds of stuff that patrons get access to. It's really like the way to get the most stuff out of me is to subscribe to the patreon the link for that is the show notes below you can also pick up any of my books return of the lazy dungeon master the lazy dm's workbook or the lazy dm's companion on the lazy the on the, the sly flourish bookstore the links to all of those are in the show notes below thank you all very much have a great day and get out there and play some D. &D.